You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. Grant McCauley, Jake Mastriani with you after what was a very good start to a four-game weekend series for the Braves. Guess a little bit more than the weekend since it got kicked off on a Thursday, but the Braves got their offense going in a 10-3 victory over the Nationals. Good way to start this four-game set as Atlanta is embarking on the last week and a half of the regular season, and you kind of wanted to see the offense wake up. Maybe a good start would go a long way. This one certainly did for Max Fried, and the Braves are back in the win column after what has been kind of a tough last week or so. We'll get into all of that here on this edition of the postcast. As always, before we get started, I want to remind you, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to Lockdown Sports Atlanta here on YouTube. You click that bell, you get notified every time we drop a new episode of the postcast and so much more here on the channel. Make sure you leave us a like, leave us a comment. We appreciate those. And subscribe to Lockdown Braves wherever you get your podcast. Uh, Jake, I would pretty much sum, you know, summarize this entire game as this is a lot more like it for the Atlanta Braves. It is. This is one of those games we talked about a lot last year, those TCB games, just taking care of business, the team you're supposed to beat uh, right there. You got your ace on the mound. Uh, I talked about the other day, too. I mean, this the streak the Braves have been on since clinching. The only two games they've won, they've been started by Spencer Strider and Max Fried. And those are your two aces, guys you expect to, to help you when you're a little bit down, as the Braves have been here lately. Yeah, you'd like to win on the day that Max Reed and Spencer Strider pitch. You'd also like to win some of those other days. Every time you say TCB, though, all I can think about is frozen yogurt, and that's probably <laughs> a deep-cut reference that uh, some of our viewers will know, but others may not. But if you don't and have it, you, you can look it up. It's what the Internet's for. But let's jump into game number 153 of the season. Braves with a 10-3 victory, now 98-55 and on the season. 10 runs, 18 hits. They left 13 men on base as well. Nationals, 68-86, and 86, three runs. A couple of them coming in the ninth inning, uh, just eight hits, uh, no errors, and eight men left on base for them. Max Fried with the victory, six strong innings for him, eight and one now on the year and just 14 starts. Of course, he's missed a lot of time. We'll talk a little bit about what was uh, hopefully something that he was able to sidestep as far as an injury is concerned in just a moment. Uh, Jake Urban taking the loss drops to three and eight. Three hours, 12 minutes. It was not a briskly played game on this night. 28,100 on hand to see it in our nation's capital. Many of those sounded like Braves fans uh, just from the ferocity of the cheering late in the game as the Braves were closing it out. And, of course, there's a few milestones and big moments were had in this game as well. I want to get to the offense in just a second, but as I'm always going to do when Max Fried's on the mound, typically I'll start with him because you feel like, Jake, that the Braves' chances of winning really start with Max Fried being on the mound, and they take a, a big step up. It's a big part of what the Braves are trying to do when he's out there is getting a good start from him to set the foundation for that. Uh, six innings of one run ball it was a solo homer, just three hits, one walk, seven strikeouts. I thought Max looked sharp. I thought the curveball was about as good as it's been all season. Yeah, eight, eight whiffs on 10 swings against it and uh, six called strikes as well. I mean, that curveball is just, it can be so devastating when it's on like it was tonight. And for the most part, I think when Max pitches, I think that's the pitch that he can usually go to and feel pretty confident in the most. I touched on it, the fact that when Strider and Freed pitch and kind of, you know, kind of joke about it a little bit, you got to win those games because yeah. typically you're going to get a good performance and in the playoffs, you're going to have to win a game that they don't start. But certainly when those two guys are out there, you know, you feel very confident. Your offense feels very confident that you got an opportunity to win that game. And Freed with the way he's pitching, the way he's pitched, he came back. I know you can't rewrite history. I just wish he would have been healthy this year because I just feel like this could have been his season, the way that he's looked and so dialed in with all of his pitches. I mean, you look at all, all the pitches he threw the night through five pitches, 10 or more times. So, uh, I mean, just the way that he, he's dialing it up and mixing and ma matching his pitches, keep, keeping hitters off balance. So uh, just a great performance for him. I, I don't, I don't, you know, certainly had no problem bringing him out with the six. I thought they might take him out after the fifth. He had, yeah. uh, you know, a big inning there where he loaded the bases, was able to get out of it. You know, certainly nothing wrong with sending him back out there, but just where the Braves were, I uh, was you know, not surprised, but I thought maybe they'd pull him out after that. But he goes back out and the sixth inning was, you know, phenomenal. So, uh, again, just a great outing from him. I still believe the ace of this staff right now. And I uh, got a while to go to figure out who's going to go first in the postseason. But I certainly think Freed has a great, you know, case to make. Yeah, yeah, I'd say he's probably got the inside track on that. I mean, the uh, experience that he has as well and some big games he has thrown. Nothing against Spencer Strider, who would be a perfectly logical and excellent choice as well. It's nice to have options, 
And, and I think the Braves have a couple of good ones right there. You mentioned the sixth inning. I think as much as anything, just based on how things have gone over the last week, every inning you can get out of your starting staff is uh, yeah. <laughs> it's important, I guess I would say, yeah. uh, for lack of a better phrase for it, because it's not like the Braves are in any kind of, I guess, panic mode, if you will, but they need to get as many innings as they can out of their starters to help their bullpen maybe not be quite so taxed. 96 pitches for Max Fried, and I bring that up because no issues with that finger, that blister that he was hoping to avoid. It sounds like he did. I, I caught up with Max Fried a few days ago. He seemed to feel it wouldn't be a problem. And, Jake, I would say that the proof is in the pudding with six innings of one-run ball, three hits, and seven punch-outs. Max Fried looked a lot like Max Fried. He certainly did. And like I said, I think one of the best things there is is just a variety in the mix of pitches. I mean, 11 sliders, 12 sinkers, 15 change-ups, 26 four-seamers, and leading with 27 curveballs is just a pitch that he had. I mean, uh, but, you know, that's why, you know, I thought maybe they'd take him out after the fifth because you didn't really want to push it coming off the blister injury. But, you know, you make a good point with the bullpen, the way it's been worked here lately. And, you know, again, it's Max Fried. Uh, yeah. Certainly, I know he wants to go back out there and continue to compete and pitch. So uh, just getting him healthy out of this, that was the biggest thing coming in. It's what I said yesterday on the podcast. Just get him out there, let him get his work in, get him out and keep him healthy. Yeah, and I think they were able to check all of those boxes. That's certainly a good thing. We'll talk a little bit about the Braves offense, which was powered by Ozzy Albies on this night. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you about one of our great sponsors for the show. And that, of course, is FanDuel that brings you this episode of the Braves postcast right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time than now to get in on the action. The app is easy to use, all kinds of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and much more. Just check it out on the app. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. The Braves, meanwhile, with their run scoring, it was Ozzie Albies who was really in the center of everything today. I mean, 18 hits for the Braves offense. You love to see that on any night. Four of those, though, belong to Ozzy, including his 32nd home run. He now has 103 runs batted in with his four on the day. Also legged out a double, stole a base. The 100 RBI, that's a marker that Ozzy has reached before it happened in 2021. But, Jake, as we flash all the way back to spring training, and I know we've talked about Ronald Acuna Jr. a lot, and we'll talk about him here in just a moment, but the two guys that could impact this club in such a huge way that really weren't you know, themselves in 2022, it was Ron Lacuna Jr. and Ozzy Albies. And Ozzy is enjoying himself quite the year in 2023 at the plate. He is, and he's, you know, obviously the power threat that he is brings a, another dynamic to this team. And it doesn't seem to matter where you put him in the lineup. You know, I, I've said before, I, I prefer him in more of that run producing spot, kind of in the four or five spot in the lineup. But where he is right now, batting behind Acuna and Michael mm -hmm. Harris, typically in that nine spot, he got pretty, plenty of run driving in opportunities there as well. But uh, yeah, he has his streaks, but you know, at the end of the season, Ozzy's going to be, you know, 30 homers, close to 100 runs batted in. I mean, it's just he's done it, you know, so many times now. It's what you come to expect. And not having those two guys, like you said, last year in the lineup, or at least Ronald, not this version of Ronald, uh, right. injured. Yeah. And not not the same thing we've seen now. I mean, big, big losses for this Braves team. I mean, when Ozzy's in there hitting from both sides of the plate, just the power that he brings, like I said, and still, too, he, you know, had a stolen base mm -hmm. uh, as well the other night. So, I mean, just, you know, doing a little bit of everything. It's just great to have him back out there. And not just that. And we, you, you know, I know you both, you being in the locker room, you know this the leadership that he brings, you know, is so important and vital for this team. Yeah. In that clubhouse on the field, before the game, during the game, after the game, and obviously what he does between the lines and at the plate, every bit of it adds up to why Ozzy Albies is so valuable to this club and losing him for half the year last year and not having available to you in that first round of the playoffs as well. It's just every little thing that kind of added up a year ago. Great to see Ozzy back and in full strength here this year, uh, up to 274 on the season. The stolen base is 13th. 32 homers, 103 runs batted in. That's some pretty good work by him. Speaking of great work at the plate, we've talked about Matt Olson, a timer 53 this year. Mm -hmm. and well, 53 as of now, because that's the number home run that he hit tonight. Ozzy with his 32nd, Olson with his 53rd. That, of course, adds to his franchise record. It also tacks on another run batted in. That gives him 132. It matches Gary Sheffield for most in the Atlanta era of Braves baseball. He's only three away from the modern record which was set by Eddie Matthews in 1953, and he's got an outside shot. I mean, it would take a couple of huge games, of course, in the final, what, nine on the year to get to Hugh Duffy's uh, 145 
runs batted in from way back in 1894. If I've got to give you a stat that is not only pre the Titanic, but pre 1900, you know that it has to be pretty special if you can get there. But Matt Olson has been doing special things all year long. Uh, great to see another opposite field home run, Jake. We've watched this guy hit 53 home runs now, and it's not just some dead pole hitter that's trying to yank it over the right field wall. It is from foul pole to foul pole, and it is impressive. It really is, and yeah, you you hit the nail on the head there. That just the swing and how he's able to just drop that bat head out on a, on a pitch low and away, and just take it out the other way, and trust that massive power that he has to be able to do that. I mean, it's fun to see see him put baseballs on top of the the chop house, and I'm all for it. But uh, you know, it's the ones where he can just kind of drop that bat on it, like I said, and just shoot it out the other way that are really impressive. The season he had, I mean, or is having is just incredible. And I, I wouldn't put pa anything past him because you know he's going to be out there every day at this point. So he's going to have his opportunities. So, uh, you know, it's just been a huge year for him. And I talked about this the other day, too. I mean, he's hitting 280. Uh, I mean, even, you know, in a best case scenario, I don't know that I would have imagined him hitting around 280 average wise. I, I don't know that I would have imagined him hitting 50 home runs, but oh, it right. just speaks to the incredible season that he is having. Well, maybe Matt Olson is just making believers out of everyone in what is possible in this very well-rounded season for him. Uh, any and all jokes aside, I mean, that felt like he was going to be a 275 hitter most years. He was going to take his walks, and he knew the power was going to be there, but uh, he has certainly gone above and beyond anything that you could have reasonably expected when Matt Olson became an Atlanta Brave. Michael Harris, the second, got an interesting uh, bump up in the order. We don't see him hit sixth a whole lot. I know he's done some of his work in that middle portion of the order. Usually, though, he's in the ninth spot. When he's not, it's typically up towards the top, but a three-hit game for him. And we saw that little bit of a lineup shuffle because, obviously, the top of the order is going to be Acuna, Albies, Riley, and Olsen, then Ozuna more times than not. But you had Harris batting in the sixth spot, Darno in the seventh. Eddie Rosario dropped down to eighth from normally hitting sixth. And Orlando Arce was batting ninth. And I think that maybe it was just the opportunity to utilize Harris in a spot where maybe he could come through for you because Eddie had been having a tough time. Rosario, one out of five. Orlando Arcia, a much-needed three-hit game for him. I kind of like this shuffle. I don't know that it'll be permanent, but I thought it was nice to just mix a couple of things up, mix up a couple of those names after the five spot in the order, and maybe see if you could jumpstart something. And a 10-run game, which mm -hmm. was powered in part by the top of the order, but the bottom of the order also made its presence known on this night. Hard, hard to argue with these results. Ten runs, eighteen hits. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you do with Michael Harris. I just know wherever you put him, he seems to produce. You want to bat him second. You want to bat him ninth. Uh, you want to bat him sixth. He just seems to get it done. And I, I do like him in that nine spot, just because it kind of flips the order and you get him on, get some speed on in front of Acuna and all those guys. But uh, look, you put RC there and he gets three hits. So maybe that nine nine spot, as it's been for a couple of years now, it's just uh, that magic spot for the Braves. But uh, Michael Harris. I mean, again, we talked about it, just the turnaround in his season and what he's done. And like I said, he can do so many things for you. It really doesn't matter where you you put him in that order. Uh, he's just, you know, a spectacular player and, you know, can help get this offense going wherever you bat him. Yeah, he truly is. Speaking of spectacular players, save the best for last. Though it wasn't the biggest game of the season for Ron Lacuna Jr. He was still involved in the Braves' 10-run outburst. Had a triple score to run his 140th on the year. He's the first player since Alex Rodriguez in 2007 to reach the 140 run scored plateau. He has a chance to get to the 150 run plateau quite obviously over the next nine games with a few big ones. And with the way this Braves offense is, that wouldn't be altogether shocking. Uh, that hasn't happened since Jeff Bagwell did it about 23 years ago, if memory serves. Uh, but for Ronald scoring number 140 came on the 100th RBI by Ozzy Albee. So all in these milestones, Jake, there's a little bit of poetry. And I absolutely love the fact that these two guys are back in there having some big nights and obviously reaching some big round numbers. And there may be a few more of those before we get to game 162. Certainly hope so. It's going to be a lot of fun watching these last couple games here. And look, I'm all for him going in home run derby mode here and trying to just launch one out. If that's what he yep. has to do to get to 40. I mean, I'm Braves that have that lead. So you can certainly, you know, try to do that if you want, but definitely want to see him get at least one more home run here. And obviously two more stolen bases if he can as well. But uh, he got it started. Look, no, nothing through the first two innings against Jake Irvin. And then you get that triple and a good at bat by Acuna to mm -hmm. get things going there. Uh, and then, you know, obviously things kind of, Took off at that point with a five-run third inning, but as is typically the case, whether it's in the first inning, the third, or wherever, Acuna, he, well, he's the one that gets things started. So, uh, yeah, look, really looking forward to seeing what he does the rest of the way. And, again, he wants to go for that launch angle. Go for it. You know, get the home run derby mode in here, and let's get that last home run. 
Yeah, I don't know that he's going to have to change much, though, to be honest with you, the way he's been swinging it. It doesn't matter what the launch angle is. I think that one that he hit, I believe, was in Dodger Stadium. I still am trying to struggle with the math of how exactly that ball got out and went the distance that it did, but that's Ron Lacuna Jr. Also worth noting, I saw on social media that uh, down in Venezuela, they're having a nice little watch party looking for that 40th home run as well. Of course, his uh, uncle is Kelvin Escobar, former big league pitcher. He tweeted out that they were watching that, or I guess he posted it on X. That's how it works now. Uh, be that as it may, a lot of people watching for home run number 40 for Acuna. That'll be the next one. It'd make him just a fifth man to join the 40-40 club, but it's the 40-40 and then some club with his 68 stolen bases now after another one against Washington on Thursday. Uh, some other good news for the Braves. The Baltimore Orioles lost to the Cleveland Guardians. That means the Braves have a three-game lead for best overall record in all of baseball. It's West Coast action for the Dodgers, who are battling the Giants, so that game not final at the time of us sitting down to record that. But as far as best overall record in baseball, it's the Orioles and then the Dodgers who are chasing the Braves there. So uh, some good stuff there. The Braves have six of their next nine games, including three more in this series, against the Washington Nationals. So a chance to beat up on a lesser club and perhaps not only get to 100 wins, but have the best record in baseball by the time it's all said and done. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about game two of the series, which comes your way on Friday. Before we do, though, got to tell you about our other great sponsor for this episode of the Braves Postcast. That is Game Time. And game Time is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. You get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You can buy those tickets in a matter of seconds, just a couple of taps, and you're set. The tickets are sent directly to your phone. You never have to dig around through your email for those notifications. You can snag the tickets without the stress at game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use the code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create that account, redeem the code. It's locked on MLB, all one word for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. You could use it if you're up in DC for the Braves and Nationals who will battle it out on Friday, 705 first pitch with Charlie Morton on the mound. He's 14 and 12. It has been quite a roller coaster of a season for Charlie. He's been up and down. It, it's seldom in between, but when he gets on a roll, it typically stays that way. And hopefully he can get on a good roll and do that against the Washington Nationals. He faces off against Patrick Corbin. Uh, ignore the typo there, but 10 and 13 on the year is the left-hander Corbin, who has been knocked around by the Braves quite a bit the past couple of years, Jake. Yeah, 10 runs, 18 hits in this one. I mean, the the way they've hit against Corbin in the re recent years, we they could uh, beat that on a Friday night. But I think the key in this one is Charlie Morton and what he looks like trying to find that command. We've talked about it. It's really been two years of this now. It's, it can be great, or he walks a bunch of people, gives up you know a couple of home runs. It's just the way that it's been for Morton here. And I think it's been more good than bad. Uh, here as of late, but still, you don't want to see him get on a good roll, find that release point, that command. And when that curveball is on, obviously, he's one of the better pitchers still in all of baseball. Yeah. And we'll see if Charlie Morton is able to dial up that curveball, get ahead of some hitters, and put away some hitters. He really ran into, I feel like it was one bad inning against the Miami Marlins, in particular, the last time out. A grand slam will make it a pretty bad inning for you. You'd like to avoid any and all of those and start to close this thing out and have a little bit of momentum, you know, some individual momentum. Heading into the postseason, Charlie has the best resume of anybody in the postseason on this Braves staff. So it'd be good to have him rolling right along as the Braves head into October. Again, he's 14 and 12, a 366 ERA. Corbin 10 and 3 with an ERA of five. First pitch set for 7:05 p.m. Eastern time at Nationals Park. That'll wrap up this edition of the Braves Postcast. We appreciate you joining us here. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube to Locked On Sports Atlanta. Click the bell, you'll get those notifications. Leave us a comment and a like. We appreciate those. And make sure you subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast. Once again, the Braves 10 3 winners over the Washington Nationals will be with you throughout the weekend. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. And until next time, so long, everyone.